Okay, are we ready? Yes, no? Okay. Okay. For those for those who speak Hindi, Chupuro. <laughs> I know it's not nice. I know what it means. <laughs> Sometimes we just say chup, chup. <laughs> okay. All right, we had Thank you very much for coming back. I appreciate that. So we had one interesting question during the break. One of the nice devotees, I just made a mistake, nice devotees. One of, one of the devotees uh, said to me, how do you tell the difference between a uh, need and a want? Interesting question. Because we want so many things. Actually, in the mode of passion, our desires are unlimited. Especially nowadays with the advertising media. I mean, I was wrong. I, I want a Tesla. That's really what I want. Not a Lexus, a Tesla. You got it? Anybody want to fulfill that need? No, <laughs> that's, that's a desire, a want. But the way you can find out if it is a need is you just ask a little question, and that question is, why? Why do you want a Tesla? Okay. So, I can save money on gas. Of course, you won't save money on buying the car, but anyway, that's another issue. <laughs> so, I can save money on gas, but really, that, that's not a why. Why do I want one? So people respect me. Why do you want to be respected? Um, I need some friends. You know, so if you keep asking, the point is you drill down on the why. And when you get to the basic, basic, there's no more whys to go, then you get to the need. Because having a Tesla is not a need. It's not on that chart over there. Nor having a big house is a need. But you need shelter. So I want that house. Why? Because I need shelter. Why do you need shelter? Well, it's a basic human need. Simple as that. That's how you can find out whether something's a need or a strategy. Desires, wants, are all strategies to fulfill needs. They may be non-productive strategies. In other words, they may not actually fulfill the need or they may interfere with other needs. Like, let's say if I get a Tesla, use that example. If, uh, if I get that, it may fulfill the certain needs I have for driving around in a nice car. Well, actually, nowadays it's not nice anymore. <laughs> it got in so many accidents. But it may fulfill one need that I have, but in the other need I have, because I'll have no more money left in my bank account, I won't have it, I'll have a need for food. So, you can see how we have to pick strategies that don't conflict with needs. So it takes some thinking. People come to me all the time and ask, in, in, in the break, people were asking me, how do I fulfill this need? How do I fulfill that need? I'm not going to tell you. You're not going to solve your problem for you. I can't. Because it is up to each individual person, the uh, facilitator or the person who is counseling has to facilitate people rather than tell them what to do. The problem with many types of psychology are that they use this thing called diagnosis. In psychology there's this thing called the 
DSM-4, DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual. Anybody here a psychologist? You know what I'm talking about then. That you analyze, you are depressed, you are psychotic. <laughs> You're a manic depressive. So, the problem is, it doesn't work. When you diagnose people, even in psychology, it doesn't work to help people. There was once an interesting study done where they had different types of psychologists dealing with patients in a mental institution. Uh, and there were psychologists who were followers of someone named B.F. Skinner. I don't know if I even know what that means. Behavioral psychology. There were, followers, there were psychologists who were followers of Sigmund Freud. There were all sorts of different psychologists and they wanted to see which ones were most effective. And there were also a bunch of people who never studied psychology their whole lives. They wanted to see if they could do anything. Pretty good. So they put them all together dealing with patients and it turns out everybody was equal. <laughs> and the ones that were most successful didn't have anything to do with the uh, school of psychology that they followed, but had everything to do with how empathic they were. Even if someone didn't know the difference between an ego and a superego, superego super is Christian anyway. Someone who didn't know the difference between ego, superego, or id, that's Freudian psychology terms, it didn't matter. Someone who didn't know what a depressed person was, as manic depressive or you know, psychotic or paranoid, schizophrenic, they had, this, they had the same effect as someone who had gotten a PhD. Pretty good, isn't it? Because they were empathic with the person. And that's really, that's really what people are looking for. And if you can be empathic with someone, they could usually come up with their own solutions, strategies. So there are strategies and there are needs. We're, we're going to study this further. First of all, we want to talk about something I call a domination culture. Oh my God, it sounds frightening. Uh, which is, and this is not a comment on Krishna Conscious Movement, it's a comment on society in general, it's a comment on how we were brought up when we were kids. I mean, for example, when I was a child, uh, if I did something, if I was naughty, my mother said, I'm going to make it so you can't sit for a week. Thank God my mother's not listening to this right now. She'd be really upset. So, of course, she never caught me, which was good. You know, the Damodar story? She never tied me <laughs> to a grinding mortar. So, uh, so, we're confronted with this. You have to do something or else you get punished. And if you do it, you get a reward. That's called the domination culture. So my reward was, this is really interesting, uh, my reward was if I did well in school, I got a financial reward. Nice, isn't it? For every A, I got, what was it? Oh, in those days money was worth a lot more. I got $5, which is worth about $100 today. I got $5 if, if I got did a B, I got one dollar. If I got C, I got nothing. If a D, I got negative amount in my account. So in this way, I became a good accountant, even at an early age. Yeah, I learned how to do accounts. So, so there was an attempt to control me through rewards. And of course, that's also how you train animals, isn't it? Well, any of you have a dog, you know, if they do something in your house you don't want them to do, which I will mention, you push their face in it and you smack them. And then they eventually learn to go outside to go to the bathroom. That's how you, how you train a dog. Or you train, if any of you have been to uh, 
some aquatic program where they have porpoises that, that, that jump up in the ground, jump through hoops. Anyone seen that before? Porpoises, dolphins. They give them fish. So do we want to be trained like that is my question. I don't want to be trained like a fish, like a horse, like a dog. <laughs> and unfortunately, in, in our childhood, many of us, it, it was like that. It was fear. If we did something wrong, my father or my mother, of course, my father never hit me. He was good. <laughs> good. Because he never hit me. So, uh, the father or mother will, I, I've seen, uh, People who, when they're 40, 50 years old, they're still afraid of their father. They said, if my father looks at me like this, I start shivering. And the problem with that is, first of all, there's two problems. One, if we give in to that domination culture, then we sacrifice our own autonomy. And when we do that, there's a problem. We become unhappy, first of all. And secondly, we lose our sense of judgment because we're relying on this training. We lose what's called a uh, moral compass. Moral compass means later on when we get old or older or not with the uh, person who is domineering or, or authoritarian with us, we don't have the ability to choose anymore between right and wrong. And so you see society is based on that. For example, <clears throat> in Nazi Germany, many people were just what? Following orders, right? That was their excuse. You know, they were taken before the uh, Nuremberg trials and whether they were in charge of a concentration camp or whatever, and they were asked, why did you do what you did? And they said, I was just following orders. And that's, the majority of people in Germany were like that. And I was, I was uh, speaking to one person in Germany who was there in World War II. And he, he explained that it was like they just snapped into a certain mindset. They just lost their ability to discriminate. That's called the herd mentality. Herd mentality means, like you see a bunch of cows, there's cows here, and the cows, they just go along with each other. They go into one pasture, into another pasture. They don't think, hey, if I stayed in this pasture, I'd have all the grass to myself. That would be more intelligent. Of course, they have a need to associate, I understand. So, <clears throat> So human beings can, can snap into this herd mentality with, <coughs> excuse, me. <coughs> excuse me, where they lose their ability to make a moral judgment. We have to be very careful about that. And even within our society, ISKCON, we've seen people do that in the name of collecting money or distributing books or something, they'll do something that may not be moral or ethical. I mean, it's important for us to always be ethical <coughs> for, the, for the reason that we want our movement to spread in a big way. We want people to respect our movement. We want to eventually take over the whole world. And in order to do that, we better be ethical and good examples. And that's what Prabhupada said. Prabhupada said the thing about his disciples was that they were perfect ladies and gentlemen. So in other words, people lost their moral, thank you, <clears throat> they lost their moral sense of judgment based upon the fear of punishment or rewards. Now getting back to that whole point, about me when I went to school, getting A's, B's, C's, D's, I never got a D. Because I didn't want to lose money. <laughs> what that did was it didn't make me like to study. It made me want the money. It disconnected me. See, the whole point of going to school, wanting a kid to go to school, is that they will like to learn. Not so they will like money, right? 
Is, is that what you want? You want people to like to learn. So when you give these extrinsic rewards, that means external rewards for something, then it disconnects people and, and it controls. It's very authoritarian. So uh, these, this sort of mm, domination type culture is very dangerous. It can turn us into monsters. If we lose our sense of moral compass, our moral compass. So remember this when you're dealing with children, and there's a whole section in my book about how to raise children in an empathic way, that we want them to be able to judge for themselves later on and not always be dependent upon some authoritarian structure. Hmm. So uh, here's, the, here's a quote from Sutta Goswami from the Srimad Bhagavatam. <coughs> that corroborates this. Sutta Goswami said, thus addressing, addressing Vyasadeva, Srila Narada Muni took leave of him and vibrating on his Veena instrument, he left to wander at his free will. And Prabhupada comments in this regard, in this purport, every living being is anxious for full freedom because that is his transcendental nature. And this freedom is obtained only through the transcendental service of the Lord. Illusion by the external energy, everyone thinks that he is free, but actually he is bound up by the laws of nature. A conditioned soul cannot freely move from one place to another, even on this earth, and what to speak of one planet to another. But a full-fledged, free soul like Narda, always engaged in chanting the Lord's glories, is free to move not only on earth, but also in any part of the universe, as well as any part of the spiritual sky. Isn't that amazing? Would you like to be like that? We can just imagine the extent and unlimitedness of his freedom, which is as good as that of the Supreme Lord. There is no reason or obligation for his traveling, and no one can stop him from his free movement. Similarly, the transcendental system of devotional service is also free. It may or may not develop in a particular person even after he undergoes all the detailed formulas. And let me unpack that. That's pretty much what I was saying in the beginning of this whole seminar, that even if you follow everything precisely, if you're not doing it with your heart, devotional service won't develop. It's not a question of just chanting your rounds. It's a question of when you're chanting rounds, doing whatever you're doing, doing it with your heart. Devotional service is meant to be executed with the heart. Too often, not only in devotional service, but in relationships, we're going to the mind rather than the heart. One of the things we're going to learn in the seminar is that usually when we use the word feel, we're expressing a thought rather than a feeling. Like if I say, I feel you're an idiot. That's not a feeling. That's just a judgment, a thought. So we're so much here in the mind. And of course, in Krishna consciousness, we're also in the stomach, too. You all know that character in the Ramayan, Kabanda? He's a big stomach and a big mind and a big mouth. I don't think there's any room for a heart. And he has, his arms are eight miles long and one day he was going to eat Ram and Lakshman. You know the story? Kabanda? Nobody knows the Ramayan here? Whew, I'm embarrassed. So he grabbed Ram and Lakshman and he was going to eat. They, he used to be a Gandhava, he was cursed anyway. And he was going to eat and then they cut his arms off and then he died. So, and they lived happily ever after. So, so, the, so sometimes I say, you know, if we're not really in touch with our hearts, we look like that too. We're just a big stomach, prasadam, and we're just passing judgment on everybody. A big head, but where's the heart? So devotional service is from the heart. Let's continue this quote. It may not, I'll just read this again, may or may not develop in a particular person even after he undergoes detailed formulas. Similarly, the association of the devotee is also free. One may be fortunate to have it or one may not have it even after thousands of endeavors. 
Therefore, in all spheres of devotional service, freedom is the main pivot. Remember that. Freedom is the main pivot. It's a very powerful purport by Srila Prabhupada. Without freedom, there is no execution of devotional service. I'll read that again. It's Prabhupada. Without freedom, there is no execution of devotional service. The freedom surrender to the Lord does not mean that the devotee becomes dependent in every respect. Whew. Very, very powerful. So, anybody have any questions before we go into the next chapter, which is called the Blocks of Communication? Yes, sir. Brahmacharya here. Any question? No? Microphone. Um, there's a purport in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Um, it's saying, speaking about um, discharging duties in mil as if in military discipline. Yeah. Um, and it says later, Arjuna did not have to consider the order of the Lord. He had only to execute his order. So it seems a little... So what was the order of the Lord? What, wasn't there manmana bhavamad bhakti? Isn't it? Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me. You know, it, it was more than just do it externally. Read the whole Bhagavad Gita. Think of me, become my devotee, worship me. But there's always that choice not to do it. Without the choice not to do it, I mean, this is basic Krishna conscious philosophy. Without the choice not to do it, there's no bhakti. That's why Krishna said to Arjuna at the end, you've heard what I said, now do, do what I ask. And Arjuna did it wholeheartedly. I mean, at a certain point <clears throat> in the Mahabharata, Arjuna was not fighting wholeheartedly. When he was fighting with Grandfather Bhishma, there's actually two stories where Krishna had to interfere in the, <coughs> during the battle of Kurukshetra. One was the famous story when Bhishma was threatening Arjuna's life. Another one was when uh, Arjuna wasn't fighting wholeheartedly against Bhishma and Krishna said, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so Krishna rushed to Bhishma and that's in the same thing that Arjuna pulled him back. Two times that happened. In the, in the full edition of the Mahabharata, now most of the Mahabharata the people have read is not the full edition. So Arjuna at a certain point decided not to do it wholeheartedly. So the whole, point, the whole point is to follow all of Krishna's instructions, not just do what he says in military spirit, but do it <coughs> with one's heart. Why else would Krishna say, manmana bhavamad bhakto, mad yaji mam namas guru? And there's two manmana verses in the Gita. Become my devotee. Okay? Yes? Sometimes. It seems like things have to get done like on a practical level and ISKCON temples need to yeah. go on and it's like, well, there's, it seems like there's no choice and sometimes like... Well, there's always a choice. There's always a choice. I'm not saying don't do it or else I get kicked out of here very quickly before the seminar is over. Uh, the, you always have a choice. Let's say someone puts a, this is one of my favorite examples, Someone puts a gun to your head and gives me, says, give me your money. Do you have a choice? You have a choice. So, yes, things, service has to be done. And I'm choosing to do it because I'm Krishna's servant. I could also choose to go right out the door. People have done that. I've seen it. You know, since I've been in the movement, I've seen so many do what Prabhupada said. Bloop. Prabhupada made up that term. Actually, it's uh, Prabhupada said it's like when someone falls from the spiritual world and they enter into a body of water and, the water, and when you throw a stone into the water, it goes bloop. That's where the term bloop came from. People can choose. They still have a choice. I'm choosing to serve. If something has to be, has to be done in the temple, some duty, I'm choosing to do that. But I could choose not to. If I'm thinking I have to, it puts me in a very strange frame of consciousness. It, I can say this duty has to be done. There's no one else to do it. 
I'm choosing to do it and I'll do it enthusiastically. You know, if it's cleaning the pots or something like that. I mean, who likes to clean the pots? Everyone. I like to clean the pots. I mean, the first day I joined the movement, uh, they showed me where the toilets were. Not because I wanted to use them, but <laughs> <laughs> to clean them. And they said, if you clean the toilets, you're cleaning my heart, your heart. I said, well, that's a little bit different from my heart here, you know. <laughs> But I took that to heart, and I did it enthusiastically, and the pots, you know, that's the first thing that happens to new devotees, they join the movement, the pots in the toilet, right? <laughs> so, and, and look, at, look at my god brother Jayananda Prabhu, who would do the most menial service. You know, there's a story about him carrying out the, the garbage at the temple, and he was preaching to someone, as he was taking out the garbage and the person thought, boy, if your garbage collectors are like that, what do you speak of your real devotees <laughs> in the temple? Because he was doing it joyfully. Imagine, you know, someone comes to the temple and they have to do RT, and I'm in that mood towards the deities. You think the deities are accepting it? I don't think so. Krishna says, Apatram puspam palam toyam yome bhakti prayachati. You have to offer me a leaf of fruit or water with devotion. Like if someone, even myself, if someone cooks for me, for example, and they have this bad mood, I won't eat what they're cooking. That's even me. You know, poor, conditioned, useless soul. There's a designation anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, because it just, it's, it's nasty. So Krishna is like that. You know, Prabhupada said that if Krishna doesn't want to eat what you cook, I mean, Radharani won't, won't give it to him. And I've actually seen that sometimes, not here, of course. I've seen that sometimes where you go to take the plate off the altar and everything's on the floor. And nobody's gone into there, except for Krishna and Radharani. Because Krishna's rejected the offering. Another, another place, San Diego, years ago, that... Uh, one day the devotees woke up, I wasn't there, and Subhadra was gone. It was just a, 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 some ashes where Subhadra was on the altar. And Prabhupada said that was because of offenses. So really, and Niyabhagraha, getting back to the point of Niyabhagraha, doing things just because it's without the spirit of devotion. I'm not saying don't do it, I'm saying have the right consciousness. That's what Krishna says in the Gita. Do your prescribed duty, but have the right consciousness while you're doing it. That's not, I'm not advocating st stopping to chant your rounds, stopping to do the service. That, that The service has to be done right. But you shouldn't have to have that have-to consciousness. It should be, I'm choosing. Just translate it. Do the same thing. I'm choosing to do it. Then you have so much energy. If I came here today thinking I have to sit here in a sweaty room, <laughs> entertain everybody, you know, just like, you know, it depends on my consciousness. I mean, I'm choosing to do that. So that should be our consciousness in Krishna, not just so. Any other questions? Quick questions. Yes. All the way back there. Sorry, I don't know everyone's name. It's hard to remember, like... 300 people's names instantaneously. You know. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, my question is about uh, difference between uh, uh, getting feedback or uh, not exactly looking for appreciation, but uh, what is the difference between getting feedback and uh, having that acceptance, being, the feeling of being accepted? Uh, so where do uh, mm. you trying to understand that? Well, feedback is one, another thing to learn how to do something better. Like I, I, I appreciate feedback for whatever I'm doing because then I can learn how to do it better. Because my real desire is to learn how to serve Krishna better. So, uh, as far as the need for appreciation is concerned, you have to. We have that need, and you have to think outside the box how to get it. You can't necessarily 
demand that someone, you can't demand that someone give you appreciation for doing something. You have to develop your own strategies for that, but it is a definite need. Does that answer the question? Uh, I was trying to understand the difference between uh, being ac the feeling of being accepted versus uh, appreciation. Or being accepted. Being accepted versus appreciation. Well, being accepted, they're completely different things. Appreciation means that someone tells you what you did for them or what you did for Krishna and or society and how they're appreciating what you did. You know, they're really feeling joyful. It's exchanging joy, connecting with you. That's what appreciation is. Is that... Uh, can you elaborate more on the feeling of being accepted? Well, accepted, accepted means friendship. It's like friendship and connection with people. Like I'm accepted as one of the devotees, like you join the temple and you're accepted as one of the brahmacharis, accepted as one of the devotees. And you feel teamwork, you feel connection, interpersonal relationships. I think they're two different things. Uh, the reason I ask that is because whenever I don't get feedback, I think that I'm, I'm not being accepted. That's the reason why I'm asking that particular question. Well, I, you don't, I, don't, I don't get feedback or appreciation. I feel that I, I'm not accepted. You feel that you're not accepted. You think that you're not accepted. Yes. Because we're talking about judgments versus feelings. Yes. yes. You're, you're feeling unhappy, right? Because you have a need for acceptance. You have a need for interaction. Interaction, uh, yeah, yes, Maharaj. Connection. Connection. Right. You have a need for connection. So maybe, maybe you want to express that to, in that particular situation. You know, whoever, whether it's in the workplace or whatever, you want to express that. And maybe, maybe someone is not giving you feedback because they're afraid of you being defensive or not admitting that you made a mistake. See, that, that's a big thing in certain cultures where people are very afraid of admitting they made a mistake. The reason that, I, that people are generally afraid when they, uh, that they've admitted a mistake is because when they were young, they were chastised for making a mistake or they were chastised for being honest about making a mistake or doing something. Like for example, you know, I go to certain places in the world and I ask for directions, you know, driving a car or going in a taxi or whatever. How do I get to this place or that place? And they give me the wrong directions because they're afraid of saying they don't know. <laughs> Anyone's experienced that? That comes from the childhood, because it, you're afraid of being wrong or afraid of not knowing something. You get chastised when you're a child, so you're afraid of saying you don't know, and you give someone the wrong directions. And of course, the person goes into the wrong place and doesn't see you again, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's a lot of fun. So. Any other quick questions before we go on to the... Yes. Mike. Uh, Maharaj, uh, even in the workplace today, um, whenever we work or do something good, there is a reward system. Like, yeah. and, and the expectation is you need to get certain rewards, otherwise you are looked down as somebody who doesn't uh, you are looked down as an underperformer if you don't get kind of constant rewards. So this is kind of like um, I don't I don't know how to take it. Their way of appreciation of whatever we do, or it is just to keep you hooked for the rewards. You have to do a certain type of work. Let me just try to understand the question. Yeah, at workplace, right? At the workplace. Yeah. 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 So there is a expectation. There's an that expectation. We need to keep doing something out of our way. So and they give us rewards. It's of the work. Yeah. So when we don't do that, if we just do our what prescribed duties at work, we are looked down as an underperformer. You get chastised. 
uh, in an indirect way. They don't nobody verbally says, but yeah, indirectly. they don't appreciate. They chastise you. So, so how do we take uh, so this kind of reward? I, I think it's a question of revealing in the workplace to your superior or the person who you're responsible to how you feel. No, how do we like what should be my consciousness in this situation? Like when there's constant reward system, and when you don't get rewards because you are not doing something outstanding, you are chastised or even if there is no chastisement, they look down upon you that you are not doing your duty. Basically, basically we are all responsible for fulfilling our own needs. We can't put that demand on anyone else that they fulfill our needs, whether it's in the workplace or anywhere else. If it, you're not getting your needs fulfilled, appreciation, feedback, whatever it is in the workplace, then you have to figure out another strategy. Maybe no. outside of the workplace. No, I'm not talking about my needs, but I'm saying that is a general expectation, the expectation. In, the, in the workplace. That the, one has to exceed the expectation and get rewards. Yeah. But that kind of reward system is keeping one hooked into getting rewards. So the actual, instead of doing the work, the, the focus goes on getting the reward, like, like how were you explained earlier. I don't quite understand the question. Yeah, so you explained this earlier also, like uh, when we are trained to get rewards, uh, the focus goes on the reward and not actually the object of why, why we are doing it. Yeah. So that is how the work culture is also, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, the work culture and schooling and everything is, yeah, so yes. how to train one's consciousness not to get... Oh, how to train not to be uh, focused on the rewards that. or the punishments yes. or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, then you concentrate on the activity itself, the um, rewards should be intrinsic for the activity. In other words, generally we are motivated by extrinsic rewards, like money and things like that. But the activity itself, one should like what they're doing. People should like to do what they're doing. In fact, there was one business book many years ago, published by the, uh, the head of General Electric, Mr. Welch. I don't know if any of you have read this. The book was called From Good to Great. Anyone's read that book? No? Okay. I read more business books than the rest of you. Just seeing, I'm a sannyasi. What an embarrassment. So, that if you, if you really want to succeed in your business field, he gave several, several, uh, basic rules and one of them is you have to like what you're doing. If you're running a company and you don't like what you're doing, you're not really going to be that good at it. You have to like what you're doing, so that's important. So the, the activity itself has to be the reward. Like if you're going to the university, I'm going to give you an example. I have a friend who went to the university to become a doctor because his parents forced him. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. So he spent, how many years does it take to become a doctor? Eight years, something like that? Even more years. So he went, he went, you know, went through medical school, became a doctor, and as soon as he got, he became a doctor, he said to his parents, now I did what you wanted, now I'm gonna do what I want. <laughs> So, <laughs> we don't want to run life like that. You know, we want to do something, even in the workplace, that we like to do. I mean, otherwise, why be miserable your whole life? Because most of the, if you're working in a job, most of your life you're spending in the workplace, right? You may think you're living at home, but you're not. You're sleeping at home. <laughs> You're sleeping at home, you're eating at home, you can do that anywhere. But you're actually living eight, including uh, going back and forth to work, commuting to work. You're living 10 hours a day in your workplace. So it's good to like what you do for 10 hours a day because you're, you're sleeping eight hours a day. You know how many hours a day? Anybody know? 15, 20, 22, 24, I know. So, 
you sleep eight hours a day, back and forth to work, and work is 10 hours, that's 18 hours. You only, you only got more eight more hours. Actually, less than, I'm sorry, six more hours. You only have six more hours. So your whole life is like that. And then when you retire, you're so miserable that you probably die right after you retire. <laughs> or you, play, you go and play golf or something like that. So basically, try to figure out something that you like to do. I mean, of course, that's Varnashram, too. Like Krishna says to Arjuna, even if you could do someone else's duty in Bhagavad Gita, just do your own duty in Varnashram. You know, Varnashram, Brahmachari, you know, uh, okay, that's Ashram. So you got uh, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. And every man can be, every man and woman can become perfect doing their own duty according to their psychophysical nature. One of the things Prabhupada says about the spiritual master is his duty, there's a duty again, uh, is to engage the disciple according to their psychophysical nature. You know, what do you like to do for Krishna? How do you understand what your psychophysical nature is? Very easy. Like the Pandavas were tested when they went into the kingdom of Virat. They had all the implements of all the things for them. You know, they had the swords. They had, uh, they had books and everything. And they chose the swords. How do you know what your psychophysical nature is? Figure out what you can do for eight hours a day without going crazy. What you'd like to do. And generally, you should do that in your workplace, too. You know, whether it's accounting. You know, some people like accounting. Some people like science and things like that. But, you know, life is too short to be miserable. So we should be Krishna conscious, obviously. That's the ultimate goal. But not in the meantime, we just neglect all these other needs. It's, a, it's not a happy life. So one more question, and then we go on to the next chapter. Yeah, or two more, whatever. Get them. Yeah. Oh. How are you going to get the microphone back to them back there? Throw it? <laughs> so, Maharaj, in the previous class, we talked about natural hierarchy. And um, one of the things I find with natural hierarchy is also that the people who are on the higher end of the totem pole have a need to control the people who are on the lower end of the totem pole. And that need to control also leads to the need to dominate people. Is that a need? I, <laughs> it is not, but most people have this need that, no, wait, or wait, requirement. Wait, wait, wait. wait a second. It's a strategy. Now let me ask you, why do they have that strategy to control? Because they feel they are... Um, they, feel. they deserve it. They are that pure, they as we may, said in the previous paper. There, they are pure devotees. They are senior devotees. They are uttama. They think. Let me, let me translate that. They think that they are pure devotees, senior devotees. But why? Yet you're not getting to the why right now. That's just what they're thinking. But why? Why do they? If they think like that, why do they think like that? It's how they feel internally, and so Why? they feel... <laughs> I'm saying that that's because of some basic need. Yeah. Maybe they have a need of security. Maybe they have a need of friendship. Then maybe it's a strategy for fulfilling a need for love. So, a two-part question. You know, let, let, let's, say, let's say I'm a big guru sitting on a big seat, and everyone's going, oh, we love you, guru. Yes, we do. We're happy. When we're, you're not with us, we are blue. So, then, let's say, let's say like that, and I'm thinking, oh, they love me. So, maybe there's a need for love. Maybe there's a need for appreciation. And if you see like that, then, then you won't see people as monsters anymore. I'm not saying gurus are monsters. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if, if, if I was demanding respect... Let's say, you know, I, I came here uh, to Project Leela's house and there was no garland. And I immediately said, what is this? Don't you understand who I am? What I've done for you? I'm an older devotee. I'm a pure devotee. Oh, no, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, 
Imagine if I did that. But if I did that, there's, there's nothing, there's actually nothing wrong with my doing that. <laughs> because I'd be showing she's empathic. She wouldn't get upset. So she would say, Maharaj, do you have a need for love? <laughs> Why don't you get a pet, you know? <laughs> so, so, so there's a basic need, I would act like that. I mean, I didn't act like that, fortunately. <laughs> because whether I have a garland or not, I mean, even today they gave me a garland, but I had a need to stay cool. So I didn't put the garland on. I said, well, don't you want to wear a garland? How are people going to respect you without the garland, Maharaj? I said, all right, if they don't respect me, that's their problem. It's not my problem. So I'm not owning someone else's, you know, whatever. So, uh, so if someone's acting like that, our being empathic is to try to understand their need. You know, of course, my need, first I have to deal with my need. My need is to be dealt with fairly. But, you know, after a while I can understand, you know, they're, they're just needing just needing uh, affection or appreciation, and this is their way of expressing it. Otherwise, we see people as monsters, and then we find fault. Everyone at all times, and this is a, a key, I don't know where that chart is, I don't know where we put it. Uh, let's see, it's not here anymore. No, not that one. Anyway. Everyone at all times is trying to fulfill their needs. There it is. See, the needs are at the center. Can you bring it up here? Would you be willing to bring it up here? <laughs> you have to bring it up here. If you don't, I'm going to get very angry with you. <laughs> You rascal, why are you taking so long? <laughs> okay, how about putting it up here? Okay, that's good. So for those of you who can see, and let's see if we can get it pasted up there. Okay, for the, this idiot who did that, you know. So, <laughs> I'm just showing you what not to do, what not to think. <laughs> so, here are our needs. Feelings, we'll get into this observation business a little later. Feelings, that means feelings, not thoughts. Feelings like sad, depressed, ecstatic, joyful. They come from needs either fulfilled or not fulfilled. Like if my need for food is not fulfilled, what sort of feeling will I have? Anybody have an idea? Angry. Has anyone ever had uh, low blood sugar here before? <laughs> Hypoglycemia. You get angry and you just want to... I mean, I, I have one of my god brothers who should remain nameless that... Uh, sometimes I have to ask him for a loan for various purposes. And when I call him up, I always ask him, have you taken Prashadam yet? <laughs> and if he says no, I say, let me call you a little later. <laughs> and if he says yes, then anything I say, he will do. So anyway... As they say, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? So, uh, if this need's not fulfilled, then we go to the feelings, boop. Then we have some, some unpleasant feelings. If it's fulfilled, uh, as they say in Spanish, anybody here speak Spanish? Barriga llena, corazón contenta. If the stomach is full, the heart is content, right? So... Uh, then my feeling is very content at that particular point. So needs are, needs are really important. They're at the center 
of this whole teaching of empathic communication. Needs fulfilled, unfulfilled, developing strategies to fulfill needs, understanding or reflecting other people's, uh, helping them understand their needs and their own feelings. That's at the very center of what I'm teaching empathic communication. And of course that's based on Bhakti Vinod Thakur again, his Chaitanya Shikshamrita where he says we have these basic needs, they need to be fulfilled if we're going to go on to the higher needs like self-realization or what Maslow calls self-actualization. Okay, I think we need to go ahead because time is short. We only got 15 more minutes this morning. I mean, to this afternoon session. We have one session this afternoon. We're going to talk about things that block communication or block connection. Let's not even use the word communication. Connection. Because what we really want is connection between each other and connection to Krishna. When you're chanting well, you really feel connected to Krishna. It's really amazing. And then you go in front of the deities, you feel that Krishna is smiling at you or sometimes he gets angry with you. I went to, in the early years we were at one temple, they weren't treating the deities properly. This was a temple that was Mexico City uh, many years ago. And I went into the temple and Radha and Krishna looked like Lord Nishingadev. I mean, literally, it was just like, they were so angry. I ran out of that temple room like anything. Because I was really connected with the team. <laughs> with the deity. So, that's true. I mean, you can connect with the deities. You can, it's connection doesn't always mean like uh, mamby pamby, lovey dovey stuff. You know, it means connecting with, ang there's nothing wrong with anger. There's nothing wrong with, with these emotions that we generally consider negative because emotions, feelings indicate needs. And it's very powerful to connect to someone, to connect to yourself, uh, to understand their needs. Because our basic need is to be empathic, to connect, and ultimately to connect to Krishna. So, we're going to talk about things that block connection. There's four basic things, there's more things than this, but these are four basic things that block connection. And the first one, they're called the four D's. And I had that written down somewhere over there, yeah. The four D's of discommunication or disconnection. I may even have, what does it say there? Discrimination? Nah, discrimination. Got it wrong. It's di the first one is diagnosis. We mentioned that before in terms of the psychologist or psychiatrist diagnosing people. Remember that? We did that just a little earlier. That we put a label on people. We went through that whole exercise of the way labels that we put on people. You know, lazy, spaced out. I'm coming up with new ones right now. Demon, Rakshasa, Chandala. And so when we do this, we disconnect from people. So I think I'm going to, oh yeah, I'm going to do a little exercise, which is really interesting. Let's see if I can find this. Normally I do that with, we do this with everybody in the room, but you got too many people here. So we're going to ask for two volunteers. Anybody volunteer? You have to volunteer. All right. I need one more volunteer. Yeah, come front. So we're gonna we're gonna show you what a label does. Need one more person. Yeah, come up. Oh, good. Okay. So I'm gonna put a label on him, and. No, he's not going to see the label he has. We're going to put on your forehead. Is that all right? I wonder if it'll stick. Let's put the hat down a little bit so it sticks. <laughs> okay. So, 
talk to him, have a conversation, and look at the label. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just consider him that labeled. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Okay, you read that somewhere in the book, but you don't really know it, do you? What that means. Um, I feel it in my heart. Hmm, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that's enough. <laughs> so you can, take, you can take the label off and read it. <laughs> the label said idiot. <laughs> so you can sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> so you see when we actually put labels on people, we, we react to them exactly like that. You know, and sometimes labels are, are racial. You know, I, I, anyway, I shouldn't give this one. No, anyway, it's not appropriate. So, <laughs> or I'll, I'll give it like, like, like I was just, I was just in India and in India, people deal with people from other parts of India and sometimes a discriminatory way. And it, it's just interesting to see, you know, racism like that. Because once you put that label on, oh, he's just Gujarati. <laughs> or he's Punjabi. That's why he gets angry. Once you put that label on people, you just don't see them as people anymore. You just see them as that particular label. So be really careful about that when dealing with people. See people as individual spirit souls. Mama Vangsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhutta Sanatana Manakshastani Andriyani Prakati Stani Karshati Jivera Sura Pohoi Nitya Krishna Das Gopi Bharata Padakamala Das These are eternal things. Because we're, here we're talking about something called Upadis. Upadi means a designation. Giving some Shastric reference for this. Sarvopati Vanir Muktam Tat Paratwain Nirmalam. If one wants to be Krishna conscious, one has to give up all these temporary designations. Seeing people as their I mean, being aware, obviously, that someone is older or younger or like that, but don't see them like that. See them as a person who is a servant of Krishna and they don't right now, may they, they may not know Krishna, may not be aware of Krishna, but ultimately they're servants of Krishna. See them in terms of their eternal label, not temporary diagnosis. So this is the first block of communication. Hmm. The second one is a really important one. It's called denial of responsibility. I think they wrote she wrote the wrong one. Di uh, oh, she has five of them there. Oh, four Ds of discrimination. Okay, got it. Denial of responsibility. Now, that's a big one because people make excuses all the time for doing what they're doing or, or lacking in certain ways. Why can't you get up in the morning for Mangalarti? I'm a conditioned soul. Why, 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 why do you drink too much alcohol? I'm an alcoholic. You know, why, why are you unhappy? Because I'm depressed. Why, you know, the Nazis again, why did you do this? I was just following orders. Uh, why did you lie to me? Well, the temple president told me to lie. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, you get into denial of reality even. I'll, I'll tell you one funny story. Oh my God, time is going fast. Uh, one funny story, I was, I was in Miami. I had just gone to the temple to become temple president and, the, and went to where the devotees were distributing flowers to make money. And in distributing flowers, 
what they were doing is uh, the brahmacharis were pinning the ladies right here with a carnation. You know, so I went there and I saw the brahmacharis going like this. You know, can you imagine? Brahmachari. I said, oh my God. What's happening? Am I in the same movement? Anyway, so, uh, so then I, I talked to the brahmacharis that night. I said, doesn't that disturb you? And they said, no. The temple president told us it's transcendental. <laughs> you know, it's, I said, well, right, uh, you must have a very Krishna conscious temple president there. So, so then, after a while, you know, talking to one of the devotees, I got him to admit, yes, I've been thinking of women all night after doing Sankirtan. And as soon as he admitted, everybody else said, yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. So, you know, we're in denial <laughs> of so much you know, in our own internal lives, you know, we should be ready to admit, you know, when something is disturbing us and not, not just say because the temple president said to do this, because the temple president told me it's transcendental, I should do it, the temple president told me to lie. Not good. It means not taking responsibility. Krishna, Krishna gives a choice. I mean, let, let's take an example from the Mahabharata, okay, and from the Bhagavatam where Krishna, uh, all right, there's Arjuna, Ashwatthama had just killed the five sleeping sons of the uh, Pandavas. And Arjuna goes, captures him, and there's the conflicting orders. You know, kill him, don't kill him. Draupadi, of course, is, you know, very compassionate. And she said, he's the son of a Brahmin, you know, his mother's going to have, be a widow, the only reason she's alive is because her son is alive. Anyway, and Krishna says to Arjuna, you have to fulfill everybody's desire, kill him and not kill him simultaneously. You know, really dilemma, really big dilemma, but Arjuna thinks outside the box. He doesn't say to Krishna, I'm just following your directions. Because he has to fulfill everybody's direction. And what does he do? He t cuts the jewel out of the forehead of Ashwadham. And this way he's killing and not killing him simultaneously. So uh, in this way there's always free will. So let's, here's a, actually we can do this exercise even though we have so many people here, denial responsibility. Uh, let everybody think of five things that they have to do, they're forced to do, that they're not responsible for. Let's say one thing. All right, forget about five things, because I'm just going to go around the room. Just think of one thing real quickly. we get one minute to think of it. We only have four, mo four more minutes of class this morning anyway. Time passes quickly when you're having a good time. So, Anyone volunteer? Something that you have to do, you, uh, it's not your fault, because you were asked to do it. Yeah. Work, because you it's not your fault. Well, it's not something that you wouldn't, let's say, something that's not nice that you have to do. Work. <laughs> Why? Okay, but uh, we're using this, uh, rephrase it again. Take responsibility, you're choosing to work, why? Because you could choose not to work. Because it fulfills some of the desires that, it fulfills some of the desires that I have monetarily. Why, why do you have those monetary desires? Because I need to function in the world that I'm living in. Like you need to eat and sleep and take care of your family and everything like that. So these are basic needs. So if you rephrase it like that, so denial responsibility would say would be saying the same thing. Well, I have to do this. I have to do that. That's the whole have to do exercise we just did before. But rephrase it like that. 
and you'll be much more joyful going to work. I mean, for example, let's take a lady who works as a bank teller. Everybody knows what a bank teller is? Bank tellers sit in the same little room for six or eight hours a day. That's torture. In the United States Constitution, that's prohibited. It's cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> if you made a criminal sit in a box like that for six or eight hours a day, wouldn't that be cruel and unusual punishment? Yeah. So, but usually when you go to the bank, the lady's smiling. And also she's counting someone else's money, which is even more torturous. <laughs> and if you're counting your own money, that's blissful. But she's counting so but what in a, in every almost every single little booth where the lady sits, there's a picture of her family there. Cute little daughter, son. Not the husband. <laughs> <laughs> Never see the husband. And she's looking there and she's saying, I'm doing it for them. And she's able to do something that's very austere to actually fulfill her need for loving connection with her family. So try to rephrase it like that. And uh, then going to work, I'm going to work, whatever, you know, your personal reasons like that. We got one more minute before the bell tolls. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Yeah, wait for the microphone. One thing that I would not like to do, but I have to do is like disciplining your kid. Although he's doing some activity and he's doing pretty good, but it, if it's not doing what you think is proper, then you are scolding him. And I don't want to scold my kid, but I have to do that. Well, we, uh, if, if you read my book, you find a better way of dealing with kids rather than scolding, disciplining, punishing, or whatever like that. But that's another subject matter. Yeah. But you're choosing to do that. Let's just take it on what you're asking right now. You're choosing to do that because why, why, do, you, why do you scold your kids? What's your motivation? It's some, I'm not saying for myself, but I'm saying that mother would see their child behaving in some other way that they like them to be behaving and you know why, why does the mother want to see the child behave quote properly see um if child came in and he didn't bow down to you i did and my child didn't so i would say that why didn't you do that and so poor, something that he did which i wanted him to do he didn't do it poor kid he'll never want to bow down the rest of his life that's a, that's so, a problem Yes, yeah, the problem when, they, when you're forced to do something as a child, it's a completely different subject matter. Right. But later on, you'll never want to do that again. I have children, no children, who are brought up, who are forced to do things, like wake up early in the morning. They can never get up earlier than 8 o'clock in the morning because they were forced to do it when they were kids. So there's a way to inspire children rather than to use discipline on them. But the reason you're doing that is because, uh, let's get to the why again, is because you're concerned with your child's welfare and spiritual advancement. Exactly. So, whatever you do should be done with that mood of connecting or helping someone else and being empathic with someone else. And we have to end right now, right? 1.45, is that right? Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you all this afternoon. All glories to Shilabalpa. Shilabalpa, keep drive. <laughs>